Well, hello everybody out there. I'm Alexander Wynn, and I'm here with Professor Richard Gombrich, Emeritus Professor of Sanskrit from the University of Oxford in England. And we're here to discuss his latest book called Buddhism and Pali, which has just been released by Mud Pie Slices Publications in, in England, I think. So before we go any further, Richard, perhaps you could just tell us how you came to write this book and what it's about. Yes, I had no plan, uh, even in my long-term plans, to write such a book, I must say, because I would have imagined that writing a book about a language that very, very few people know, in fact, very few people have even heard of, and I'm not just referring to Britain, but the whole world, and a language which is uh, quite unlike English, and is basically um, an ancient language, even though it's used um, even now for certain purposes, um, I wouldn't have thought that that was something which would appeal to the general public. And uh, so I had no plans to write a book about it. But I have founded something in Oxford called the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies, which I founded on my retirement from my chair, which was the chair of Sanskrit at the University of Oxford in 2004. And I founded it because I had been teaching Pali regularly as part of my duties, though not a major part of my duties, I should say, um, at the university. And when I retired, I feared that there would be nobody to succeed me and the classes might dry up. It was a very rational fear and it's been touch and go ever since then. And there is in fact nobody now employed on a permanent basis at the University of Oxford to teach Harley. And partly for that reason, I had already made one of my main activities as founder and uh, academic director of the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies, the OCBS, giving Pali courses to which people were, in, uh, where they were advertised all over the world and people could come for a fortnight in August and study Pali with me. And I guaranteed that they would be able to read with some help from dictionaries, of course, and even from existent translations, to read parts of the Pali Canon if they wanted to, after they had just had this elementary course. So, and they were so pleased with this, the people who came, which I'd uh, arranged for year after year, that I thought, well, I should actually go a little further. And I developed the teaching of Pali considerably. And the video you're watching now, you know, this interview, is really directly a result of that. But I never thought of writing a book about it. And the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies, which is a charity, an educational charity registered with the British government as a board of trustees. And just about three years ago, somebody joined this board of trustees. He's called Tony Morris. He is a Buddhist, and he is a very active publisher. And he went on a holiday walking in the Welsh mountains, which is where he comes from, and came back full of enthusiasm for a new idea he had, he said, called mud pie slices. I have no idea what that was supposed to allude to, if anything. But he said that the mud pie slices would be a series of rather small books say about 15,000 words each book, or even a bit less than that. In other words, about 100 pages, rather small books on Buddhism and something. And he planned a series with strange titles like Buddhism and football, Buddhism and walking, Buddhism and the menopause. I can't tell you all the things which are going to come out. Hmm. But he'd been as I say, involved with the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies for a year or two, and uh, he and was trying to, very much to be helpful. And he just got in touch with me. He's a very enthusiastic and persuasive person and said, 
I want you to write the first book in this series, Buddhism and Pali. And I can tell you that I was not very enthusiastic about the prospect at all. I thought it was a rather crazy idea, actually. But then I soon discovered that Tony Morris wasn't put off so easily. <laughs> and I thought that uh, <laughs> rather than make an enemy of one of the trustees, I'd better do what he said. And so I sat down and started writing. And this has happened to me several times. I've got a lot of publications to my name, books and articles and so on. And most of them, the ones which are original and interesting, have been done in the way that students are usually told not to write. The students are told that they should, if they've got to write something, whether it's a doctoral thesis or a weekly essay or whatever, they should think about it, do some reading, and then make a plan. And if they're going to write a long thing, like a doctoral thesis or a book, they will say, you know, on this plan in chapter one, well, it's obviously introductory, but I have to cover such and such and such and such. And then uh, say it's got six chapters, you plan what's to be in each chapter, and then in chapter six, you say you're going to sum it all up. And you show your supervisor this plan, and he may criticize it, but that's how you write the book. And it's exactly how I say I don't write books, and I don't think that it suits everybody to try to write like that. I've always found that the best thing to do is just to start writing. Just get on with it, with as they are now telling us with Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and uh, what, what I've written on page one then leads into something more, and that determines what's on page two, and what's on page two more or less determines what's on page three. It's like writing a long letter to a good friend. I always make that comparison, or well, to a relative, of course, it can be to your younger brother or something. You um, tell what you're interested in, and why, and what you're going to do about it, and let one subject lead into the next. And that's exactly what happened with Buddhism and Pali. And I thought, well, um, one assumes that uh, in a short book of about 100 pages, I'm not going to have to say very much about Buddhism. People have plenty of other sources for finding out about Buddhism. I'll only say about Buddhism some things which are relevant to Pali. And my job will be to describe Pali in a way which is intelligible to people who don't know, obviously who don't know Pali, but perhaps don't know very much about languages in general, um, and tell them the main characteristics of Pali. There are three, or generally said to be three levels of a language. You start with the sound system or the phonetics, what letters they use and how they're pronounced. And then there's the morphology, which is the grammar. In other words, how the words uh, change according to their use in a particular sentence. And then the, the third and highest level is the syntax, how to write whole sentences or parts of sentences, um, fitting it all together and giving a meaning to a sentence as a whole. So I thought, well, I have to write about those things, polyphonetics, poly polymorphology, or something just as grammar, and poly syntax. But first, obviously, I also need to write something placing Pali in time and space. In other words, the history of Pali. How did it come to be used? It was used by the Buddha. We'll come back to that. And then um, sort of to what extent has it carried on? And the history will probably also have to answer some questions about sort of where did it come from, which is perhaps interesting and certainly rather controversial. Um, so that's what happened at first, that I wrote an introduction about the history of Pali, in which I must confess I you made use of something I'd written quite a few years ago, an introduction to a famous grammar of Pali, Geiger's Pali grammar. And I repeated some of that material, adapted it a little bit, 
And then the, so that was chapter one. Chapter two was then about the, the describing Pali in the very basic way of describing the, the sounds and what, how they make a system, the sound system. And then the third, that was chapter two. And then the third um, chapter, well, I call chapter two the linguistic character of Pali. And then the third chapter was about Pali prose style and conventions. And that describes the distinctive features of the, the prose style of most of the Pali canon, which is the Pali canon, I should say, is the set of texts which are ascribed to the Buddha and his teaching in India in the fifth century BC. And they're mostly in prose. Um, a few are in verse, and some of the prose uh, uh, sections also have a few verses in them, but describe that style. So that was chapter two and chapter three, and it didn't take me very long to put down a sort of summary of what I know about those things. And then came chapter four, and I introduced it, the use of Pali lies at the heart of Buddhist ideology, in that when the Buddha was preaching and the canon, the Pali canon, was being formed, it was conceived of as the opposite of Sanskrit. And thus, it symbolized a far-reaching rejection of Vedic Brahmanism. In other words, the main intellectual uh, class of India in the days of the Buddha, the fifth century BC, were Brahmins who employed a language they considered sacred and in some ways uniquely qualified to describe the world. In fact, they didn't think it really described the world. They thought the world was fashioned by, the, by God uh, to fit Sanskrit. We, mm. we may find this a rather strange idea, but that was their idea. Because mm. I gave these four, four chapters to Tony Morris, and he said, I like it, but you know, you have to draw readers in by telling them something about yourself and why you have studied Pali and what you were about. And I've said, I said, I don't want to do that. I think um, Pali is much more interesting than I am, and I don't see why readers should be interested in me personally. And he said, no, 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 you've got to do it. You've got to do 10 pages on yourself. And so that's how, in fact, the book begins the mm. prologue, Discovering Pali. And I owe him a great debt of gratitude because I've given the book to a lot of people to read and most of them write back and say, um, I've started it by reading the prologue and I really like it and enjoy it. <laughs> they don't say, I'm not going to read any further. I can't tell whether they are going to read any further, but the book does therefore have a kind of personal beginning and it's matched by an epilogue, something at the end, after, the, after chapter four, about what I think of how to teach Pali and what the future of teaching Pali is. Um, got, uh, gives you the whole idea. There are four chapters with a prologue and an epilogue. So the prologue is actually so you were, interesting because you talk about yourself and despite going to one of the best universities in the world, you say that you're basically self-taught. Yes. Did, did you not get taught Pali in university? Uh, not really. I, um, it was rather a bit shocking, actually, because um, I myself had switched from studying Latin and Greek to studying Sanskrit, and the Sanskrit course in Oxford was about three quarters or a bit more than three quarters about Sanskrit, and then what they called a subsidiary language, you could choose from several which they offered you. Um, and Pali was one of those. But very little attention was paid to it. It didn't get much weight, for instance, in the final examination. You had to take two papers on Pali, but that's not very much. Mm. And my teacher, uh, Professor Thomas Burrow, was a rather famous philologist of Sanskrit. He'd written a book about the Sanskrit language as well as lots and lots of articles. But he 
didn't read these texts for what they said, he was only interested in how they said it. He was purely onto language. And when it came to Pali, well, that wasn't his field particularly, and he didn't actually really want to teach it at all. So he just would give me a book and say, read this. Mm. Um, not a book about Pali. He never ever told me to en of anything which could be read about Pali, but he just uh, encouraged me to, uh, well, prepare myself for the exam is the blunt and accurate way of putting it. The funny thing is that in the term when I was supposed to start Pali, he was away on leave. Okay. And there was a, a, a professor from Calcutta called Professor Bhattacharya, who was in the Linguistic Survey of India. And he and Professor Burrow did fieldwork together in India on languages spoken by very small minorities in India, most of which are Dravidian languages. That, they, then that is, they're not related to Sanskrit or Pali at all. And they went away and did their thing. They were doing research. And then Professor Bhattacharya was brought over to Oxford to work with Professor Burrow. And he was also asked to teach me. And he taught me in the time-honored Indian way, namely that we started on page one of Geiger's grammar, which I've already mentioned. And he more or less dictated to me what was on the printed page in front of both of us. <laughs> Not a very... <laughs> <laughs> into enlightening way of studying anything. I don't think, um, I don't think they get away with that these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was nobody in those days who told you not to do it this way. Professor Bhattacharya was a very amiable man. He knew a lot about his own subject, which was certainly not Pali. He probably depended on Geiger's grammar for his knowledge, which he passed on to me, in quotes. Um, and so I really was not well taught at all. And when I, through a series of fortunate accidents, fortunate for me, that is, uh, became lecturer in Sanskrit and Pali after getting, and sometime after getting my degree, uh, I was really rather upset that I had to teach this language, which I felt I had never been taught properly and didn't know very well. Hmm. But I discovered that there was somebody in Cambridge, that's the advantage of having two universities at the top of the hierarchy, Oxford and Cambridge. There was somebody in Cambridge called K.R. Norman, who was really quite an expert on Pali, a world expert, in fact. And he was very, very short of pupils for years at a time. He didn't have any pupil in Bali. And so when I said the first time that I had leave, could I come over, stay in Cambridge? I had a friend where I could, with whom I could lodge. Could I uh, come and have some Pali lessons from you? And he was really very pleased because not anything about me, but he was <laughs> just pleased that he had a pupil. And so, I came with all my questions and we started reading Pali and I owe a good deal of my knowledge of Pali to my teaching by Professor Norman. Though once I'd got to that higher level, I of course could do rather better at teaching myself than had been the case originally. Mm. So that's how I got into Pali and most of that is not in <laughs> recorded in this little book. Well, it is not very credible. I think people who might be watching this interview might be at least encouraged to learn that you were mostly self-taught. It's not a good way to learn anything. Uh, and uh, I mean, in those days also, there were very few works of reference. Mm. Um, I was... Uh, Warder's inter, um, Introduction to Pali, which is quite a good book, though it's got its mistakes and, and disadvantages, that only came, uh, came out after I'd started learning Pali. So there wasn't even a decent primer. There were some very old fashioned ones. I see, okay. Okay, so that is your personal beginnings in Pali. Um, so let's look now in the, some of the content of the book, just in the beginning then in chapter one after the prologue, so you talk, okay, Pali, as the word Pali comes from the compound Pali Basa, the language means the language of the texts. 
So the word Pali in that context means a text for recitation. Um, you say something a bit more about this word. Uh, yes, I can. Well, first, I should uh, make two comments about this, which are important. The first is that I conclude in chapter four, as you say, and that's probably the most interesting thing that I do, that Pali was actually the language that the Buddha spoke. And what we have in the Pali texts, although the language changed a little bit, as all languages do, um, after the death of the Buddha, it is nevertheless fundamentally the language that the Buddha spoke. Now, if I tell an Orthodox Buddhist, follower of early Buddhism, a Theravada Buddhist, that I've discovered that the Buddha spoke Pali, they will look at me pityingly because they think, well, I always knew that because Orthodox Buddhists believe that and always have believed it. Of course, they don't have what we Western scholars would consider good evidence or good arguments for their belief, but they say the Pali Canon presents itself as the words of the Buddha, which is called in Pali Buddha Vachana, the Buddha words. Um, so they don't think I've discovered anything new at all. Mm. I've merely gone a long way around to find something that they always knew. Um, and then secondly, I should say that the way that uh, philologists, that is scholars of, of language, and um, have approached the problem and continue to approach these problems, is they say, well, Ali, we can see, is derived from Sanskrit. We don't know exactly when or exactly where, but in particular, um, it is rather like other languages which are also derived from Sanskrit. Um, people watching this uh, may find it easier to grasp what's going on if I say that we know that there were, was Latin was spoken by the Romans who uh, uh, conquered and governed a large part of Europe for several centuries. And then after Latin had been going, for some centuries, there developed what we call the Latin languages. The languages derived from Latin, French, uh, French, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Romanian, and uh, one or two minor languages as well. And they are recognizably derived from Latin, and so they're called the Latin languages. They are, so to speak, children of Latin. And then there's a set of languages in India derived in exactly the same sort of way from Sanskrit. And they are called Prakrits, and Pali is a Prakrit. And just as is in the case in Europe, really, um, these languages are called by the geographical area where people speak them. So, uh, so you say Italian is spoken in it is the language derived from Latin, which is spoken in Italy. And the Prakrits are all derived from Sanskrit, and they're called things like Magadhi, which is spoken in Magadha, or uh, other geographical terms, you see, from different parts of Northern India. But the problem is that Pali is not the name of a language, of, sorry, of an area in India. And so there's been a tremendous amount of argument about where does Pali come from? It must come from some particular part of India. And scholars have disagreed very violently. It certainly comes from sort of the northern half of India, but is it part of the west or is it part of the east or somewhere in the middle? There's been a lot of disagreement about it. So all it's called is Pali Basa, the language Pali, but the language Pali doesn't tell us anything about, about the origin of Pali. But I have pointed out that the great commentators on the Buddhist texts, when they talk about the texts which they're explaining, say that there are the 
texts which are in Pali Bhasa, the language of Pali, and Atakata, which is the word which we always translate commentary, but really means talk about the meaning. And th this is a pair, Pali and Atakata. Now, if one half of what they're explaining for us is these texts about the, which talk about the meaning of the other texts, what are the other texts? So it's something to do with how they were used. And of course, in those days, there was no writing. And the way that you learnt texts was by reciting them again and again and again. You memorized them. It was all done by memory. And incidentally, although writing was discovered and used in India shortly after the time, rather shortly after the time of the Buddha, to this day we can see, if we go to Buddhist countries, that uh, the uh, people who join the Sangha, the community of Buddhist monks and nuns, learn their texts entire, almost entirely orally. They don't read them from books. They possess books, perhaps, but they practically never consult books. The teacher recites and the pupils repeat the recitation. And uh, on various ceremonial occasions, for example, monks and nuns get together and recite texts. And even if you go to, say, China and look at Chinese Buddhism, that is exactly what happens. People recite, often they say chant, if they're speaking English, they say chant, um, recite the texts, and that is how they memorize them and how they know what they contain. And so I said that it must be texts for recitation. And I found a Sanskrit word, um, parkya, which means uh, to be recited. Mm. And I said, although Pali doesn't look very like the word parkya, there are parallels in the development of Prakrit to this development of something like Pakya with a PH in it uh, to Pali with an L in it. And even if that seems a little far-fetched, and here comes the other really important point, even if that's a little far-fetched, my belief in how scholarship should proceed is that you always give the best available hypothesis. So I say, well, Pratya makes sense as the name of the Pali language, but if you don't agree with my derivation and don't think that Pali means that, what does it mean? Because it must have a meaning. I'm putting forward my theory as the best available hypothesis that it is the meaning, uh, the meaning is text for recitation. And I'm very glad to be able to say, of course I don't say it in the book because I didn't know it yet, that the Pali, language, uh, the Pali dictionary, which is now being composed by Margaret Cohn at Cambridge, uh, has reached the letter P now, the volume is not yet published, but Margaret Cohn, who was a pupil of mine long ago, has very kindly sent me what she has written about the word Pali. And she doesn't say that it comes from Pratya, but she does say that Pali seems to mean text for study or recitation. As study would consist of recitation, that's the same thing. Mm. So I'm very glad that uh, somebody who really is an expert in these matters of philology, seems to agree with me about that. So if you do agree that Pali means what I say it means and has that derivation, it, I have nothing to say except, but give me a better theory. And that's what I say throughout. I also say the same about my theory that Pali was the language of the Buddha. Well, well, we'll come on to that shortly, but like this, yes, I suppose this is this is much more uh, about much more than just Pali. This is your general approach to academic work, is to formulate the best Entirely. hypothesis. And so, what you're saying, this is a hypothesis about what Pali means, what the word has meant originally, 
And apart from that, there was there is no hi hypothesis about it at all. There is just the word itself, and nobody has said anything much about that. Exactly. It wasn't I who originally pointed out that um, Pali is a is a shortening of Pali Bhasa, the word Bhasa meaning language, the Pali language. That was a German scholar, Oskar von Hinuber, and he pointed that out quite a large number of years ago. And I should perhaps add that he doesn't agree with my present theory about the word Pali. On the other hand, he's not presented a better theory. So I'm going to stick with it till somebody does that. Okay. You're quite right that that is how I uh, view everything. It's very fashionable these days, especially in the United States, or should I say North America, to be very skeptical about what we know about the Buddha and say perhaps there was no such person as the Buddha, though I can't quite understand how the text could have arisen without somebody. And the Buddha is, after all, just a title given to him, the enlightened one. But they can be as skeptical as they like, but until they produce a better, a more plausible theory, I don't think that we should give up our old view. Quite. Well, let's move on to your other bold claim in the book. Your claim that Pali as a language was created by the Buddha in the, well, in the course of his wandering and teaching. I suppose you could, what you mean is that it crystallized out of the Buddha's activity, his, his mission of teaching, and the language that comes out of that is, you're saying that that is the Pali language approximately as we have it in the Pali canon. Yes. You see, the question has always been put, all right, Pali derives from Sanskrit, it's a Prakrit, Prakrits, it's rather arbitrary where we call them languages or dialects, which have a def definite location of origin. And indeed, because the Buddha operated quite a lot in a part of Northeast India, which was called Magadha, um, Pali was known by the tradition of the Buddhists as Magadhi, the language of Magadha. But there are problems with this because the mainstream of, in, of Indian culture had another Prakrit called Magadhi, which is not the same as Pali. It has a few, sim it has some important little similarities, but it's not the same. So, why is Pali not Magadhi would be one way of looking at the problem. Now, as you were just saying, Alex, the, uh, the Buddha preached at a time when there were no means of communication as we know them. Uh, there was absolutely, of course, there was no means of recording. And, and first and foremost, there wasn't any writing. And the only way to get uh, texts or knowledge or statements, or whatever you like, uh, around the population was for people to learn those things and then, uh, uh, then to s uh, speak them in front of and communicate orally to other people. It was all done by oral communication. And the Buddha, as far as we know, preached for 45 years, wandering around a fairly large area of northern India at the time. Um, and there's quite a lot of evidence for this, the fact that he wa walked from place to place. It's often mentioned in the texts themselves. When the Buddha had finished there, he took a company of monks and walked across to such and such a place or whatever. And often at the beginning of a text, it says where it was delivered by the Buddha. So that, that was the on, only way in which his message could be transmitted. There was no other possibility. Mm. Now, so the trouble is that people have all asked, all right, Pali is a dialect of Sanskrit. From where is that dialect? 
and they haven't made use of a concept which I must say I didn't know much about called lingua franca, mm. uh, the, the uh, sort of free language in a general area. And a colleague of mine at Oxford, Dr. Imre Banga, who is an expert on North Indian languages in the last thousand or fifteen hundred years, long after Pali was started, is writing a book showing that uh, there are these lang there are these languages, which is usually the name with which we dignify something which is used for writing texts and so on. And they are quite distinct. They are usually sponsored by a local government in some way or a local education system. And then languages cover areas in which real people in real villages speak the local form of the language, which is we can call a dialect. But also there are people in these societies like traveling salesmen and of course, holy men, a kind of traveling salesman, but they're selling their religion, as it were, who not only do they have to travel from place to place and be able to make themselves understood and understand other people in particular local dialects, but they, they know a whole lot of these dialects, which are all slightly different, but they have certain common features. And so they can put together something which will be understood by anybody from that general area and without exactly replicating it. It's a lingua franca. And if you want to think of something a bit comparable in Europe, I don't know if I'm being very accurate, but for instance, Norwegian and Swedish are so close that on the whole, the speaker of one can understand the, sp uh, so the speaker of another. They're mutually intelligible, though they're fairly systematically different in certain ways, but still you can understand between Norwegian and Swedish, or should we say between Polish and Czech. Uh, among the, the Slavic languages. But th there's also in, the, in Scandinavia, there are two forms of Norwegian to start with, and there is also, also Danish. And probably in, in anybody who speaks any of those four languages will roughly be able, if need be, will be able to communicate with anybody who is a native speaker one of the other, another one of the four languages, though it gets a little more distant um, between certain languages and other languages. But you could make up something which was a kind of amalgam of the two forms of Norwegian, of Swedish, and Danish. And, then, and if that was used, that would be a lingua franca, a, a, a language which is not anybody's first language but which is understandable by putting together data that is both the sounds and the grammar and so on of different uh, languages in this area. Now, what struck me suddenly about Pali was that it has so many variant forms. Mm. Now, a, a natural language uh, doesn't have a great many forms. Um, and because you don't need them. Uh, if you want to say um, the genitive of cat, it's like you uh, to make the genitive singular, the possessive case, you put apostrophe S on the word, it's cats, of, of the cat or of a cat. And that's the only way to do it, unless you don't actually change the word cat, but you say of a cat. So we have two ways of doing it, but that's quite sufficient and covers pretty well every kind of word in mm. our language. But Pali has an extraordinary large number 
of different ways of expressing thing, simple things like possession or these case relationships. And that suggests that actually somebody has incorporated in one way of speaking whatever is done within a large area where they don't agree about all these things, but they will be able to understand if a sufficient number of them overlap. And that's what I think a lingua franca is, and what became the lingua franca of the Buddhists. There's a further concept here I, just, I introduce, which is not very difficult to understand, the French word argo, and that is that a, a group of people who live together, do things together, and generally share a life, and therefore also share a lot of concepts, and, which include descriptions of how they make their living, and so on, that's called an argo. Mm. And so if you follow a particular trade, especially in a traditional society where you're not much influenced by the very high learned language which some people speak, you don't need that at all, either to understand it or to use it yourself. But you want to talk about what you deal with, in the Buddhist case, the teachings of the Buddha and what he recommended, You'd use this language, which you will, if you meet somebody or, uh, who uh, also becomes a monk or nun in this uh, community that you have, you become a kind of linguistic community, as well as wearing similar clothes and having similar habits about food and your daily routine and so on. You also share a particular form of language. And I suggest that the earliest Buddhist shared this form of language, which was hammered out by the Buddha, perhaps not entirely by himself, but by his closest disciples, the people who came with him, more or less wherever he went. And they had this way of speaking, which they could understand each, as, which enabled them to understand each other mm. and then pass it on to new converts to new people joining their community. I see. So I think that Buddhism evolved at the beginning, this lingua franca, which is not quite dialect, but as a combination of dialects, if you like, mm. and the lingua franca of Northern India. And the reason why scholars have stumbled over this is that they didn't have this idea of a lingua franca as distinct from a dialect, which would only have one set of forms right. and would be peculiar to one limited area. So we have a few different elements here. First of all, we have a sort of an ascetic or renunciate or Buddhist argo, which is a sort of specialized language which is being used amongst that particular class of people who have left the world. That's one way yes. of looking at it. As the yes. Buddha in particular, he roams over such a wide area, speaking in lots of different local forms, that this argo is expanded into a sort of lingua franca. Is it that sort of process? Yes. Well, I don't, the only thing which I don't quite agree with the way you put it is that, that the, um, you can't say the argo came before the lingua franca. It's rather more if there's a sequence, yes. the, there's a lingua franca which becomes their argo. Okay. <laughs> so, the, okay, we have a lingua franca. Now, um, it mentions in your book, and this brings in the idea, um, this is a different idea to the idea of Pali as Magadhi, um, which that might start to be seen as a bit of a red herring because Sinhalese Theravada Buddhists have claimed that their language is Magadhi. But of course, they yes. received the language and the texts at the time when the Ashokan Empire from Magadha had spread all over India. And as far yes. as I'm concerned, that is where Buddhism comes from, of course. That is where Bodh Gaya is. Yes. However, it's quite curious that in the, the early Buddhist texts, after the Buddha's awakening, he doesn't seem really to go back to Bodh Gaya. And he spends most of his time especially in the kingdom of Kosala and the town of Savati. 
So possibly we're thinking of a lingua franca related to that part of the world, and that's something you mentioned in the book as well. Well, I got the idea from you, but yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, and I got it from T.W. Rhys Davids, uh, a great British scholar of Buddhism. So he said this, this is Victorian era Buddhist scholarship, but it turns out to be a really good idea and quite useful in this context. Yes, I think so. Okay, then can we call the lang this language of Buddhism a specialized version of the language of the kingdom of Kosala? Would it be too simplistic to say that? I think it's a little simplistic. Um, after all, in the, in the first sermon, mm. which if it really is the first sermon, and I don't see any strong reason for doubting it, we do have Magadisms, what, <laughs> uh, uh, distinctly Eastern forms, like Sukhalika, Sukhalika with a double L, and the very fact that the Buddha addresses the monks at the beginning in Pikave with a with the final E, which is a characteristic of, again, an Eastern form of the word. Mm. Um, I think he started off rather with more Eastern forms and perhaps we have to go through all the texts and the evidence might not be sufficient to help us get to a conclusion, but see, did he actually spend more time up um, in, in the Kosalan area mm. or, and, or was it just that he, he would drifted in that direction later. But the, it, the it, first, it, sorry, the, the first sermon, that's an interesting example because this is, of course, in Benares, in the deer park of Sarnath. Now, yes, I it suppose is. if for somebody, if you look on the map of India and see where Sarnath is, it's sort of, I suppose, right on the boundary between what would have been Kosala and the expanding kingdom of Magadha. So yes. that is right in between them. That's yes. Buddha has come from Bodh Gaya, where the texts record him, or at least people speaking to him with a Magadhi type of dialect after he's attained his awakening. And he is then, the texts represent him as moving to Sarnath and still using what we would say are dialect forms. It yes. Was, but we know that the Buddha, I mean, for there are lots of texts which show us that the Buddha was on uh, personal terms, more or less friendship terms, with both the king of Kosala, Pasinadi, and the king of Magadha, Bimbisara. Right. Um, so I think he was pretty much equally at home in both of those two kingdoms. Yes, of course. So... Pali then as a lingua franca, just say a little bit more about the, the variation within Pali. Um, you mention it in your book, a lot of the variation is due to what we have in the, what are called terminations. Pali is a classical language. The yeah. ends of words vary quite considerably. Now, is this unusual, for, is this a usual feature of language or not? I am claiming that it's not usual to have so many forms. I, I mean, a very simple thing uh, is that about 90% of nouns of substance words are in the declension with the stem in it, a, in short a. And the, if you look down the range of forms which are used, it's rather bizarre that in, for instance, the very common thing, the locative case, Mm -hmm. uh, which is used in, for literally location, but also metaphorical location. It's a very, very common case. Um, you have either dhammi or dhamamhi or dhamasming, three completely different forms. And the same is true of the ablative. Uh, so the locative singular and the ablative singular will have three completely different forms. There is no... Abs nobody would disagree with my saying that there is absolutely no difference whatever in meaning. There is not the faintest nuance of difference. Why would you need that? I mean, we uh, have the nominative I for the first person and the accusative me 
And we don't have alternatives for I and me. Well, they do have alternatives in the accusative. They have alternatives all over the place. Mm. And in vocabulary, you've got, for instance, the, the rather common word in Sanskrit, murga, which means a deer mm. or, or, or altogether a wild animal. And then in Pali, it splits into, there's a word miga, M-I-G-A, because there's no vowel R in Pali. And there's also the word maga. And there's also possibility, I think, that, that in certain cases, actually, it was a U there, muga. So um, what to do with the Sanskrit vowel R? Clearly, there was a lot of difference between different languages or dialects really with which the Buddha had to cope. So okay this is I mean this feature that there are variant forms has been noted with regard to words such as Arya in which you have an alternative such as Aya. So yes. that type of variation has been noted but I don't think many anyone or many people have mentioned that the actual terminations the bits that you put on the end of a word in a classical language, Pali varies tremendously in verbs, in nouns, in pronouns, adjectives, everything. It does indeed. And in, in verbs, it's sometimes quite startling because, for instance, in the optative, the, the kind of uh, verb which is not that you state something, which is an indicative, um, it is raining. But in the, in the way where you make it vaguer, or it might be raining, or it would be raining, or something. We have, of course, a range here in English, too. But there, in English, we have different meanings. But throughout the optative, you have three possibilities uh, of how to form it. When I say throughout, I mean both in the singular and the plural, and in the first person, second person, and third person. You have this vast range. Why on earth would you need, instead of six terminations, 18 terminations from which to choose? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this, I mean, this corresponds quite well with Buddhism at a philosophical level. On one very important point is which, when you read the language in the text and you see that there is such variation, it really does bring home the point that it's just conventional. And there's no need to systematize whatsoever. Philosophically, this ties in with what you, you have talked about and written about the Buddha's argument with Brahmanism and their understanding of language and reality. So Pali as a, a dialect, a lingua franca with many variant forms and the Buddha willing to allow variation is quite Philosophically, it's very close to what the Buddha is saying about a lot of other things as well. The way reality is, it's, and the conventional use of language. So you talk about this in chapter four a little bit. Yes, absolutely. I think that's very important, but of course it's well worth the whole book. Mm. But um, for the Brahmins, you have, you have the word cow and you have the animal cow. And the Sanskrit word for cow is for them eternally tied to the animal cow. And in fact, many Brahmins held, it was, there was some disagreement, but the basic view of the Brahmins was that what was there originally was the word, or if you like, for, that's of course a concrete object, but to, shall we say um, happiness, an abstract, there were, the, there were these words which in, indicated our conce conceptual uh, uh, paraphernalia for the, for the world, what the world consists of. And then the world has to conform to that. Um, in other words, I'm say, putting this in a rather complicated way, but in the, there is the idea that the word cow, or the Sanskrit word for cow, precedes the actual animal and the animal was then formed by the gods to fit the words so the, so sound, Sanskrit, the sound comes first and reality is built out of the sound a very specific sound it's not yes although they don't i think necessarily say put it as the sound they would say the word as a whole i think mm. 
Um, they, I mean, they don't at this stage differentiate the phonetics, but that, that's right. Mm. What you're saying is correct. So um, that there's, if you understand language properly, you understand reality properly, and vice versa. And the Buddha thinks this is quite, quite wrong. And he points out, uh, probably because he was familiar with linguistic plurality, I think most Brahmins didn't travel very far to understand the full range of languages. But we know from a text in the canon that the Buddha knew that there were people not all that far away to the north and east uh, and west of India who didn't speak a language derived from Sanskrit at all, who spoke different languages, and there were different ways of expressing reality, and therefore that there was no inherent connection between the word for something and that thing itself. Mm -hmm. And that in fact, if you wanted to say um, the cow is in the meadow, um, it depended uh, what language you were taught when you were growing up as a child, how you put it and it could be expressed perfectly adequately by foreigners, people from outside India, who didn't understand a word of your language, but spoke a completely different language. Well, that deeply impressed the Buddha, obviously, and he therefore reached the correct conclusion that language is entirely conventional, and anything that can be expressed in one language, he would have said, can be expressed in another language using completely different words and very likely often different grammar as well. So um, language is a system which you try to make fairly consistent in order to be able to communicate in it, and it is not reality. But there, there is such a, it doesn't prove that there's no such thing as reality at all. But it proves that reality can be expressed in many, in fact, probably in an infinitely large number of ways. And this, of course, was why the Buddha encouraged people to translate his texts. It's why Buddhism could become a world religion, be to, uh, the t uh, scriptural texts could be translated into Chinese, for example. Whereas, of course, the Brahmins resisted this, just as Muslims have for many centuries said that the Quran is the word of God, it's in a form of Arabic, and it should not be translated out of that Arabic. It will never mean exactly the same in another language. So they take the Brahminical side, and the Buddha takes, shall we say, the modern philosophical side of the, on this question. Except the point that although the Buddha allowed translation, and there are texts saying that, he did forbid one important language not to translate into, which is Sanskrit. Yes, he thought that if people use Sanskrit, that the whole Brahminical argument would sort of creep back, obviously, and people would think, no, no, this is the right way to do it, and there is no other right way. Um, he, and this should actually also be connected, as I do very, very briefly, to another theme that he has, which comes in different parts of the canon in slightly different contexts, that he says, is that if you want to understand what I say, it doesn't matter whether you remember the exact words. The exact words are not the point. And if you only understand the words, then that only is fatal. You haven't really understood anything. You have to understand my meaning, what I am trying to say. So, so you, yes, well this, I, I suppose the final point then we can come on to is something you've raised in an other writings. Um, the Buddha was against literalism and- Yes, exactly. Yes. So you, I, I forget where this is in the book. I think on page 96 is a section on pragmatism. And you've written about this a lot in your works, uh, especially with regard to the Buddha's skill in means. So this Pali as a language as a whole, would you say that this is something, an expression of the Buddha's skill in means? It's an expression of his skill in means, but also it goes a little further than that because he, know, he shows that 
we need something like this. We need a means of communication and we need to understand that this is only a means of communication. There's a pragmatic reason for using it, but it doesn't have any kind of eternal or transcendental validity at all. And he says, in this village you call a pot so-and-so, in the next village you call the same pot so-and-so. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. You can use any word you like as long as you understand what you're talking about. This is wonderful. This is exactly the type of attitude which uh, is expressed in the simile of the raft. It is indeed. And it's also, I think I learned a great deal from the great uh, scholar monk of our time, where he died about 20 years ago now, the Venerable Dr. Walpola Rahula, a Sinhalese monk, um, who wrote the very, very popular and successful book, um, What the Buddha Taught. Mm. And he, I had the great good fortune to get to know him rather well. And he told me that he quite often went to teach in America and he always told the Americans he, they needn't bother about the fact that they didn't know foreign languages, they could still understand Buddhism without knowing any foreign languages because, he averred, anything that is said in the Pali, by the Buddha, in the Buddha's words, can be said in Pali, but I don't need to use any Pali words to explain it. I can explain it in English. Maybe I have to use, in some cases, rather more words because I don't have just exactly the word fitting the slot that the Pali word fits, but nevertheless, I can explain what I'm doing. And he said, when I teach in America, I teach entirely in English and tell them that they are not missing anything through that because English can express the Buddha's meaning as well as any other language. So a modern expression of the old Buddhist idea of pragmatism and skill in means. Indeed, <laughs> yes, good. Well, so we've been talking about your book, um, lots of very interesting things about the nature of Pali, the history of Pali, and its uh, connection with Buddhist philosophy even. Um, at the end then, the final part, there is an epilogue, and you talk about the future of Pali. So just yes. perhaps we could end on this, and I hope there will be a future of Pali, but... Um, there are still not exactly many places that you can learn Pali. No. And I'm afraid I'm rather a pessimist about the future of Pali. I wish I could end on a more cheerful note. But why, one has to look at the world as it really is, and in, in a Buddhist sense, and realize that partly due to the internet, which means that if you know English, you have access to almost anything. The study of languages generally is in catastrophic decline. I've witnessed this very much through my life. When I was a schoolboy, it was not very difficult to go to a school where you would be taught a little French and or a little German and or a little Latin. And it's become rare. And I must say that the standard was pretty awful, but still, there was some attempt to give British children the experience that there is another language and there are people living not very far from us who speak another language and you may one day find it useful to be able to talk to them in your own language if, you're, if you've lost your way or are desperate for a cup of tea or something that you can speak to them. It didn't go much further than that, but still, that's something. And now, well, um, when my grandparents died, they had quite a fine library of German literature, and I tried to give it away, and I found it was absolutely impossible. Mm. Well, you get everywhere the response, but that's in German. Who knows German? <laughs> and the answer is, well, Germans do, but it has to be said that Germans do learn English on the whole, and they tend to learn it quite well, too. So for purposes of communication, they're way ahead of us because they know their own language and they know English. 
And therefore, I don't think the prospects for a language which very few people know outside the Buddhist countries of Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia mm. are very good. But we must battle on. And after all, the Pali Canon is one of the greatest documents that the human mind has ever produced. Um, people have no idea what a lot of fascinating thoughts and, and indeed sometimes occasionally also very beautiful expressions there are in the Pali Canon, not as many beautiful ones as there are uh, intellectually interesting ones, I think, but still. And uh, people have to be persuaded to learn Pali, but it is important, I think, to tell them don't get the idea that it's very difficult just because ancient India is far away from t from us in time and space mm -hmm. and indeed that Sanskrit is pretty difficult but Pali is much much easier than Sanskrit and difficulty shouldn't be so great as to put you off from learning it and with your new book then we have a new reason to inspire people to learn it which is they can think of it indeed as the language of the Buddha. <laughs> That's my ambition. <laughs> Perhaps rather hubristic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Richard Gombrich. It's been fascinating speaking with you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.